Ramble. Welcome to Curious with Josh Peck. Start the show. Guys, what's up? Welcome back to the Curious Podcast with me, Josh Peck, and you, the listener. What do I have to say? Not much. You know what I mean? I'm not going to bore you today with one of my long diatribes full of self-portant mishagas. Mishagas, it's a Yiddish word for... I don't know. It's so hard to translate. It's like, it, it just means like uh, bullshit. Like, uh, well, what? I don't know. How is everyone? Are you guys good? It's Thanksgiving, the week of Thanksgiving. So you guys are probably stressed out, traveling, going to see the family. That's always an opportunity to to create some new resentments and to awaken some old ones. You know, right? You got, uh, you got far enough away from your family, enough time passed where you said, ah, I'm, I'm over that. You know, that cousin of mine that always seems to phrase her questions a way that feels like she's like attacking my life's choices. Uh, She's not that bad. Or my dad, who was actually not really around when I was a kid, who tries to act like that never happened and, you know, be in my life now. Well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm over that. I'm past it. But you get there and the first couple hours are okay, maybe. But then that family member does that thing that awakens that old funny feeling inside of you. That thing that makes you feel all types of uncomfortable. Right? I mean, I've got family. I know what it's like. And I know what it is to, you know, have those resentments. Not good. Not bad. Maybe just life. Maybe just a part of it. I steer clear of people that are too evolved. People that feel like they've got it too figured out. I have no interest. If I figured it all out, well, then I, I, you know, then what else is there for me to do on this earth? You know what I mean? Uh, The reality is, is I'm sitting in my car right now talking into a microphone, looking like a kook in front of Gelson supermarket because I forgot to do this earlier in the day. And well, the podcast needs an intro. So here I am. Sorry, Kevin, engineer, producer, extraordinaire, my guy, the one who's going to, you know, cut this into the podcast. I'm sure Kevin's got a nice relationship with his family. Not like us, listeners and me. You know what I'm talking about. It's dysfunctional because people are flawed and they're all just doing their best. Maybe or maybe their best sucks. And that's the problem. I No one has a heart to tell anyone that like your best is not good enough for me. You know what I mean? And I honor that you uh, that I believe that's all you got. And yet I have no interest in participating in your best because it, it falls short. You don't have enough. Sorry, you don't got the goods, brother or cousin or sister or mom or dad or whoever it is. You know what I mean? And the holidays are a beautiful moment to see clearly how flawed those individuals are. And here's the best part. We will have kids. And we are the young ones now in our 20s and 30s. And we are the woke millennials who feel as though we've got the proper perspective on things and people and places. But eventually, inevitably, we're going to get older. We're going to start resting on those laurels. And we'll all get a little weirdly eh, political and curmudgeonly. We'll start having strong opinions that aren't necessarily based in anything uh, logical. But they will serve us because they're convenient and we're used to them. And they, we've, you know, they, they afford us some sort of comfort in this crazy, cruel world. And then our kids will be looking at us the way we look at our parents and the people around us. And then we'll be those kooky, weird 60 plus folks, maybe 70, eh, 60, you know, and then we'll become them. But you know what? We'll be too old to care. So fuck it. So I, I, I say bring it on. I say the more the merrier, let's go, let's do it. You know what I'm saying? I can't wait. I wish you could all tell me about your weird things. You know what? Email me, peckagent at gmail.com. Email me some weird interactions that you have at Thanksgiving this week, and I will read one of them next week on the air live. This isn't live. It's a podcast. The medium itself can't be live because it's pre-recorded. That's why it's on demand. So the whole idea of it being live, that's ridiculous, and I don't know why I said it. I recorded Jeff Ross today, and that'll air next week. And what a what a pleasure. What a guy he is. Felt really lucky to do it. He's just a mensch, 
as the Jewish people call it, yet another word. I know you guys must be there, you non-Jews or people that don't speak Yiddish and be thinking, what does this kooky Jew need to speak in this weird ancient language for? This language is not relative to my uh, everyday life. It's not relevant. I'm sorry. It's just easier. But Jeff Ross, good guy. That's what Mensch is. Good, good boy. Good person. Loved it. That'll be next week, so get excited. Want to know what this week is? Damon John. Heard of him? FUBU. Ever worn it? I bet you have. If you're like me, a 90s kid who grew up loving hip-hop culture, a chubby white kid from, you know, the west side of New York City, FUBU, that was like the greatest. When your mom came home with a FUBU jersey, fuck, you knew that she was getting paid. That work was good that week. And she made a little extra scratch. I don't know how. But she brought home a little extra money and decided to, you know, bestow me with one of the illest, dopest jerseys. I mean, FUBU meant the world to me. It, it was culture. Um, Damon John created that clothing line. He's a serial entrepreneur. You might know him from Shark Tank. Um, he's an incredibly smart, lovely dude. And we've known each other for the last five years, six years. And uh, whenever I see him, it's just always a pleasure. He is, because uh, he's a gentleman and, and a sweetheart. And it meant the world to me that he was willing to do the podcast. And I can't wait to share him with you guys because uh, I think uh, and not only is it a good interview, but uh, you might learn some things, you know? Take some notes, entrepreneurs out there, people that are trying to start some biz, trying to do some things. Maybe you shouldn't get all your hustle tips from Instagram, and you should get it from a tried and true pro like Damon John, who's next on the podcast. Enjoy. Love it. Good. Mm-hmm. Cool. Can can I say that I can't believe we're friends or kind of friends? If you want, I, yeah, I, yeah. I I, I, I kind of love it. Yeah, we don't talk often. That's all right. We, we should. Right? Yeah. Maybe this will be the fuel that reconnects us. Yeah, exactly. This is a spark <laughs> to a real yeah. Damon and Josh friendship. No problem. I like the I ring to it. that. Um, so let me just start with, what does it feel like to be the goal? The goal? In the sense of like, there must be so many people that look at you, men, women, entrepreneurs, people that think like, God, to only attain that level of success or notoriety, I would feel... Like, it would be people's finish line to a certain extent. Here, you want me to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just adjusting this mic. There you go. No, okay. not at all. Um, what, so what's it feel like to be on the other side of that? Hmm. Well, it, it, if it's a personal goal that you are you are putting on in your life to be, you know, get to my level or supersede my level, I love it. You know, that's why... That's why I do all the public speaking and the educational stuff, because I want you to know that if my dumb ass can make it, you can. <laughs> um, but if I'm your personal goal to get to, I don't like it because it puts a lot of pressure and, and you have this false sense of uh, perception that I can solve all your problems and I don't have any. Right. Yeah, so. Do you think that, it's funny, I, I interviewed my buddy Dan Fogelman last week, mm-hmm. and he's the creator of that show, This Is Us, yeah. which is huge, and yeah. big movie coming out, and I, I gave him a similar question. I was like, to someone like me, having a hit show and a huge movie with big stars coming out seems sure. like the goal. I said, and yet I suspect that there's still some inner conflict that even at that level, it's not completely comfortable that every time you hit the finish line, it moves. So yeah. would you echo that? 100%. Um, yeah, you know, like, you know, type A personalities, they're never satisfied, mm. even though I'm grateful. You know, I'm grateful for my health and my level of success and my family and my, you know, my loved ones and the, and the way that I can sleep at night by the decisions I make. But what's tomorrow going to be? And if I don't know what tomorrow is going to be, because I don't know what, what tomorrow is going to be, how am I going to accomplish it? Uh, but yet something's going to put these symbols in my way and or flags in my way to start guiding me towards that, you know? 
And what I, I remember they asked Obama, like, what keeps him up at night? Yeah. He probably should have said Trump, but <laughs> <laughs> but he was like, oh, it's Pakistan or like, what's the one thing? So maybe not keeps you up at night, but what seems to be a thing that brings you some disease or never quite feels finished that you're always, always striving for? Health. Mm. Health these days, you know, um, I was diagnosed with stage two cancer, thyroid cancer, uh, two years ago, wow. um, cancer free, and I had it um, taken out of me. So thank God, right? Um, thank God. Um, but what's coming tomorrow? Like, what's the you know, as as we mature and get older, what's coming tomorrow? You know, how do you how do you 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 make sure you have all those things in place because there are the things that you can prevent. There's the things that you create, and then there's the things you don't know are gonna come. Um, so that keeps me up at night and again, and then being a father, you know, of course it's always going to be my three little girls going to be okay, you know, cause in the event my health goes and I die, I live 10 lives. I'm okay. Sure. You know, but who's going to protect them? Right. You know, what's that like when you get the call and, and you're told that you've got cancer? I don't know because I had it and I didn't know I had it. So when they did a surgery to take a, a lump off my thyroid two weeks later, they said, by the way, that was cancer. But the the other call was come in. We got to keep checking on it. Oh, it may have moved to your lymph nodes, and those calls are they're scary calls, you know. Yeah. And, and again, like I said, I'm so grateful. If God is God is going to take me out tomorrow by crossing the street and getting hit by a car. I'm fine with that. Really? But what happened? Yeah, I am. I am. But because I hear people say that, and then I always wonder if in the back of their mind they're like, oh man, I really. God, I I hope I don't go that way. <laughs> no, I want to go that way. I don't I don't want to be you know sitting there you know shitting on myself for for you know seven yeah. years and don't remember who my family is and be right. wheeled around. You know, that is you know like a stroke is a is God's version of a bad joke. You know what I mean? Uh, I I don't want I want to go quick. Good I night. Go. Yeah. I want to overdose while eating White Castle. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. That's how I want to go out. Hundred percent. Nice and easy. Yeah, man. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you grew up in Hollis, yeah, in Queens, yeah. Uh-huh. And what did in the eighties? Yep. What did that look like then? What man, Hollis was amazing in the eighties. It was amazing and it was challenging. You know, um, you know, Hollis, Hollis is birthed more rappers than any place. You know, in 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 the square five miles, you had. I don't know. LL Cool J, Run DMC, Tribe Called Quest. Heard uh, of them? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, Lost Boys, Fifty Cents, uh, Ja Rule, Salt and Pepper. You had everybody there. But you know, growing up in Hollis, you know, uh, when we were growing up, right around '84, the 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 neighborhood got ripped in half because this drug, like in like in all of America, crack hit the streets. So you started seeing young kids become millionaires. So much that even even um, Reagan had addressed the crime in Hollis because uh, a cop was assassinated by some crack dealers. But because we didn't have social media at the time, anything else, we never, you know, young African Americans, we had nobody to look up to. But who do we have to look up to? The drug dealers. Right now, all of a sudden, Russell Simmons and run and he starts putting out Run DMC and Def Jam is created out of Hollis Queens. And now all of a sudden, we have two places to look. Wait a minute, we can sell drugs. Maybe go to jail or most likely die. Oh, wait a minute. We can make money traveling the world and this new art called rap and make a lot of money and have a good time. Right. So the neighborhood got split in half. And we started, you know, and I, I went over to the rap side going, I want to dress these people, you know? And did you, of course, never asking you to implicate yourself, but like, was there ever a temptation to go to that quote unquote easy money side, like sort of the darker side of the force? You know, if you ever watched the movie Belly, that was made about my friends um, and uh, they were all drug dealers. And, and the funny story is, you know, at the age of about uh, 12 or 14, I had one friend, he said, I want to be big in music. I had another friend who said he wanted to be a big graffiti writer and maybe, you know, videos were out at the time. And another friend said, I want to be a big drug dealer. And I said, I want to be head of fashion. So fast forward to when we were 30, it was me, said I want to dominate fashion at 12 years old. The kid who wanted to be a graffiti writer and director was Hype Williams. The other kid who wanted to dominate music was Irv Gotti. And the other kid who wanted to be a drug dealer, Hype Williams made the movie Belly about the drug deal who's still in jail. So we all hit our, you know, our goals. I was never tempted to be a drug dealer because um, 
you know, most of the drug dealers went to jail. I was really cute and really small. I didn't want to go to jail because I didn't want some, you know, 400-pound guy, you know, making me wash his underwear. Fair. So I decided I'm not going to yeah. do that. Didn't want to take a tour of beautiful I, Rikers? I, I was not man enough, no. <laughs> man, I'm first not. of all, what was in the water at Hollis that all your closest friends became like titans of industry? You know what I think? I think it's, I think it's, we got to look up at Run and Russell and all them, and we got to set our goals on what we saw was closest to us. Yeah. And that was infectious, right? Because Run DMC would go on and put five people or 10 people on from the neighborhood, and then, then LL Cool J would put five people, and not just rappers. They would be a bodyguard. They would be a producer or a director or whatever, the, an engineer. And these people keep going. So it just was infectious, you know? You know, it's funny. I... I grew up in, in Hell's Kitchen in the 90s, mm -hmm. and so it wasn't the Hell's Kitchen it was in the 70s, right. but it was still, you know, slightly so seedy and whatnot, and having the domineering Jewish mother I had, there was just never a chance that I was going to start fucking up to, you know, some, right. some youthful hijinks at best. Sa you know, Did same, you have the same? Same with me. You know, I used to break dance, um, okay. and I was pretty good. I was pretty good at it. What's pretty good? Are we talking windmills? Are we talking No, like... no, no, pop. I was, I was, oh, I was, just pop. I was, I was, I was a good popper how was your top rock uh, no i was ill i was ill with that okay yeah, yeah, i was kind of with that excuse me but uh i remember i got a chance to audition for houdini to go on tour with them and my mother said hell no what are you <laughs> talking about you're 16 years old you're not traveling the world with some band named houdini and you know who took my place uh, some Jerry Hurl, Jerry Curl head kid named Jermaine Dupree from Atlanta took my place on that mm. tour because my mother wouldn't let me go out and, you know, you know, uh, you know, go on tour. She ruined it. I could I could have been a drug addict at uh, 18 by the time, you know. God, wait, thanks a lot, mom. Yeah, same <laughs> here. So what was your family dynamic like growing up? Just, uh, you know, uh, my mother and father, you know, uh, got, got a divorce when they were, when I was 10. So I would never see my father again or speak to him after that. My, wow. My mother raised me, um, single mom. And then my stepfather, who I love, came into my life uh, about uh, 16. My mother and him never got married, but he happens to be of the Jewish faith. Okay. Um, good people. Yeah. He was, he was Some, good. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, and he taught me a lot of things. He taught me that love doesn't come in a color or a gender. And he told me that white people are just as screwed up as black people. So, uh, you know, he, he taught me a lot and it, it gave me the ability to walk in the room, not as a black man, as just as a man. Right. You know, and to understand that, uh, that, you know, you don't judge a person by the color of their skin, that we all have the same heartaches and passions and loves as everybody else. Not to overly generalize, but have you found, especially in New York growing up, that like Jews and African Americans, like there we there was a shared struggle yeah. that like that we identified with each other. There was a commonality there. I always found that, um, and, you know, again, I you know, I guess because of the Jews, they they always were, you know, as as my friend would say, like they're they're, and he, he wouldn't say it in the proper way, but the, <laughs> the n words of, uh, of of Europe, you know what I mean? And sure. and you know, we they all, I never had a, I, I it was always so amazing my my um relationship with other cultures actually my my stepfather his brother was the main attorney over here in america for uh the uh fighting apartheid and the release of mandela really yeah so i always look at i always say black and black and white get together they make green or they make change you know right you know, it's funny I, i'll always remember a moment i think i was 16 and it was like 10 o'clock at night and i was bringing my friends over to like i don't know play video games mm -hmm. my mom was asleep my friends who were black, I was like, guys, let's just be quiet because my mom's asleep going to my room. And they were like, okay, cool, because we, we heard Jews don't like black people. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and it just was so, it was, it was, it spoke to the human condition, right? That yeah. there's misconceptions. Of course. In every sort of culture and whatnot 100%. and projections. I know a good amount of black people that don't like black people. Right. So, it, it, like, you know, so, uh, you know, it's people with a lack of information, I think, mm. uh, you know. And I come from a single mom. I never met my pops. Yeah. And I never sort of had that, you know, stepfather, father figure. But I've seen how it's revealed itself over time. And now I'm 31 and I'm going to be a father. Mm -hmm. Sort of like the, the nuanced ways in which not having that figure has informed the person I am. Mm -hmm. And so will you speak to that? And how was it? I'd love to know, like, 
times maybe in which you struggled with that, not having that father figure maybe, or what was it like? I really don't know. You know, my mother is such an amazing woman that I'd never miss the the lack of having a father. Same. And I think that um, it made me a man earlier on in life. And I, I, I stepped up and took the responsibility of being the man of the house. Um, I think that maybe if I did have a father in my life, um, knowing, you know, the way, you know, my, 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 my father's from Trinidad, I would end up growing up, you know, doing the normal college route and nothing wrong with that, but I would be an engineer or a mathematician or something like that nature. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I never missed it. Yeah. Yeah. I say that too. And yet I would see, I've figured out ways. It's funny. People that, that I know that had a great father figure. Cause I knew that my dad was like living in Florida, had a whole other family. Yeah. So I had like half brothers and sisters and they said, well, how could you not want to meet him? And I said, cause I don't miss what I never had. And yeah. I don't know from that. And yet I would see growing up how I would sort of put unnecessary expectations on men in my life because I was sort of putting them on a pedestal, like making mm -hmm. them quasi father figures and what have you. Like, did you ever notice certain things you would do like that or not really? No, not, not really. Not that I, no, I never leaned on anybody like that. Again, you know, I had the joy of having somebody come in my life when I was about 16 years old who played that role. Sure. Um, and I didn't expect them to play that role, but, you know, we became, you know, very close. And, um, yeah, I just, but I, I never had an issue with that. Did you take issue with, I remember growing up because I too felt sort of like the man of the house at yeah. a young age. And that my mom never talked down to me. She always brought me around her girlfriends mm -hmm. and they didn't treat me like a kid. Yeah. And so then when I would be in, put in a position and someone would talk to me like they would talk to any 16 year old or mm -hmm. 14 or 18, I would feel disrespected. I don't want to be like, I'm the man in my house. Like, don't talk down to me. <laughs> Little did they know I had all this shit going on and they yeah, just yeah. think I'm a knucklehead kid. But I'm like, nah, nah, you don't know the responsibility I have and that I'm the man in my house. So like, treat me with that respect. Like, did you ever have that? And, um, yes and no. You know, if, if they didn't respect me, I'm, I may have a little bit of that issue. However, you know, growing up in a traditional African-American, you know, house and community, you know, you never called anybody by their first name, any parent, any adult. Everybody on the street had the right to beat you if you did something wrong. <laughs> right. So you ain't talk you ain't talk back to the elders like that. Um, so it's a little more stern in my neighborhood. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I could say, don't talk to me like that. And they would smack me. And then, you know, if they smack me, then I'd go home. My mother said, what happened? She, I'd have to say, well, they smacked me. And she's like, what do you do? I had to tell <laughs> them. And then she'd have to smack me too. So. All right. So. <laughs> so Getting on so both ends. A little more. Yeah. Yeah. And was there in falling in love with sort of hip hop and, you know, you hear so much of, of especially in young men, like there's a desire there's always that extra layer of like, and I knew that a certain level of success would attract girls. Yeah. Was that true for you in any way? Well, it, no. So it wasn't true in the regards to a certain level of success would attract girls. Uh -huh. It was in regards to why I started the company was to attract girls. Oh, it I wasn't, see. It wasn't at the further end of it. It was at the beginning end of it. Really? Because I need to go to video sets and everybody was getting kicked off of video sets. But if I would be able to be on video sets and holler at all the video chicks, then, you know, so I would have the T-shirts and say, well, I have this T-shirt here. It's I'm I'm styling the, the artist. So wow. you, you can't kick me off sets. I couldn't care less about styling the artist. So I all I want to do is holler at the video girls. God bless. Yeah, that's it. Does that ever go away? No, it doesn't. I mean, think about that. Like, you know, if, if the women weren't around, we wouldn't have you know, we wouldn't have cars and anything else. We'd just be naked eating beef jerky, man. There would be nothing else to do in life. Word. Yeah. I I did this movie about breakdancing with Chris Brown, and don't I know you're looking at me like, what were you doing in that movie? <laughs> <laughs> but and I remember it was me and like twenty other b boys, like the best b boys in the world, and we were shooting for a month but just us guys, and it started getting weird on set by week two. Like, too many dudes without any female influence were like nothing, farting, there, there nothing like else to talk talking about. shit, yeah, people uh, are getting into shove matches. Yeah, it's just nothing else to talk about, man. Yeah, it's too much. Yeah. Um, so what was your first foray? When did you first take your leap into creating something for your own line? Like what was the, the tipping point? The it was moment? 89. Um, it was Easter Sunday. It was Good Friday. Um, excuse me. Good Friday. It was 1989. And I decided to make a couple of hats because I was trying to buy a hat. This little tie top hat it looked like a cut off sleeve with a 
string on top. I couldn't find it anywhere in, in, in Queens. And I finally found it uptown Manhattan. I come home with my mother and show her the hat. I says $20. She said, Damon, just go to the store and get $40 worth of fabric. I can show you how to sew hats like that. I go to the store and I bring my $40 worth of fabric, but it's the same exact roll of fabric. I wasn't thinking about I should bring back a little bit of green, red, so I can have different hats. Sure. So now all of a sudden, I have one roll of fabric. I have 80 hats that I would sew, and only in one head. So I said, what do I do? And I just I went on the corner, and I just started selling them that day. And that was the, the moment that would change my life, because I would make $800 in about two hours. Um, and it, it, the light just went off. I said, wait a minute, I'm in charge of my destiny. No boss gave me this job. I was able to sell or not sell depending on my ability to sell or the product I have. And I never want to ever have a boss again. And you never did. Really. I never did. No. And what was the fashion influence at that time for you? Like, wh who were you inspired the brands? by? Yeah. Well, because well, I would name it FUBU later on. I would, the hats didn't have any name at the time. I would name it FUBU later on because I felt that like all the brands were starting to say, well, we don't like African-Americans or we don't like inner city kids or break dancers. And it was just this big thing. But at, at the time, you know, my brands were uh, Lee's, Levi's, Kango, Adidas, Fila, you know, Alessi, Lecog Sportif, all the brands that we would, Carhartt, Timberland, all the, all the, all the you know, the initial uh, hip hop brands. And why fashion? What stuck out for you where you're like, that's my path? Come on. It was always going to go back to the same thing. Girls. girls, man. Really? I had to look good for the girls. Okay. That's it, man. All right. God, I had to look that. good for the girls. I couldn't play sports. I wasn't, you know, big and, you know, whatever. I, I had to look good for the girls. So the girls always like guys who were put together. And is there, you know, now of like the... And I don't know who the Titans are, but like you look at the Balmain and the, you know, Karl Lagerfeld and all these guys. Like, are, was there any figure like that that you were aware of, like a guy like that or a woman that you could look up to? That Ralph Lauren, Tommy right. Hilfiger, I think. But I looked up to, of course, Carl Kanai because he, he just came out and, I, and he's the one that I saw a hang tag of him. I said, wait a minute. I can make these things myself. Wait a minute. Wow. This right. guy looks cool. Um, and those are the only ones I knew. I mean, I didn't know Lagerfeld or Tom Ford or uh, maybe Bill Blass was out at the time. God, Tom Ford is sharp. Yeah, Tom is fire. What does he look like? Well, I bet he gets out of bed like that. He's cool. He's he's cool as hell. You yeah. know, have you read his rules of no. like, I, I, I he has these rules and I'm not quite sure exactly what they are, but certain things like men should never wear shorts unless at the beach. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he, he's, he's probably very, very, very detailed. Oh, yeah. Course. He's like, loungewear should only be worn when lounging. Nice. Otherwise, you should be like in a crisp suit. Yeah. And, yeah. Oh, he's fly. Yeah. He's crushing it on another level. Yeah. Shout out Tom Ford. But is he happy? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I do want to talk about the quick detour of a side job that you took in a Red Lobster because I want to know everything about that. What's that? Red Lobster? Yeah. I want to know what it was like working there because the Cheddar Bay Biscuits are fire. They were fire. And I want to know about the ins and outs of the lobster who is red. Tell me everything. Yeah. So, um, you know, that really gave me my training for to be a businessman, a salesperson. Um, the biscuits, I hated them. Really? Yeah. Why? Because people come and ask for them and drink a bunch of water and leave. And be out. And be out. I'm no wait, tip. I'm waiting for a tip. No, but you get you get paid off the amount of food, you know, percentage of the food. But you just ate a bunch of biscuits and you bounced on me. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. So, um, but, you know, it taught me so much. You know, it taught me that, you know, that they would they would uh, give us bonuses or incentives for add-ons. So they basically said, you know, you don't make money off the steak. You make money off the dessert, the appetizers, and the liquor. Mm -hmm. I would understand that later on going on in my business. You don't make money off the expensive coats, but it, but every brand, we make more money off of jeans and T-shirts than anything else. I don't care what design you've seen or anything else. We make money what we call margin builders off of t-shirts. Right. I learned, uh, you know, um, how to, you know, they would cut down the wait staff due to the flow of people coming in and out, you know, with, with within an hour. So I learned how to reduce my cost and, you know, in business. Also the managers, you know, you know, listen, on, on, on Valentine's Day or Mother's Day, the cook always quits. I love right? it. They, they, they'd be like, yo, I'm done. Too many orders. We got 300 people coming in and I'm done. And the manager would have to flip his tie back or her tie or whatever she's doing and get on the grill, get on the dishwashing. And I learned that, you know, a true boss is supposed to jump in at 
any and every point. This is a corporation. So imagine if you're an entrepreneur and it's your business. Right. Right. So there's so many basics that I've learned or the or the shrimp scamping when they reduce it from 11 shrimp to 10 shrimp. Nobody missed it, but they saved like something like seven point eight million dollars. Right. right. So these are the things that I would end up learning and retaining moving into, you know, the my, my business career as an entrepreneur. Is there any one story at Red Lobster in particular that sticks out in your mind that you'll never forget, like Kitchen Confidential style? One story that I would also go is that the small things in your business are the ones that kill you, right? So it's the it's the small losses that you take. And I would remember that there was this one, well, I, I got two stories. Well, <laughs> one of them was that they would always take the shrimp, the boxes of big boxes of shrimp, and they would called the G run, throw it out and throw it into the garbage. And they would drive, the, the cooks would drive around, get the shrimp out of the garbage and go sell it to the Chinese restaurant for a hundred dollars a box. Great. So they must've been stealing thousands of dollars worth of food. So you got to watch whether in your company right now, don't leave the supply cabinet open because whether they're trying to steal or not, but the people are taking home the pens and the paper for their kids doing, uh, you know, school work and stuff like that. Don't don't rent these. Co- well, not anymore with Uber, but you used to get these, you know, these these car services and people ha- go to dinner and have these car services out at night all night. Before you know it, these small things eat up four or five, 10 percent of your your margin. Right? right. And so I would learn that about theft. what We call it leakage. Also, I would learn how to no matter what. You have to be really, really nice to somebody handling your food. Yes. Because don't complain until you are leaving. Right. Because I have seen, we used to play football with somebody's steak in the back if they were really a nasty person. That's mental. There was a really nasty waiter, I remember, and he would always, you know, somebody was treating him bad at the table, like, you know, like snapping their fingers and being a real jerk. He would say the best thing to spit in is blue cheese or Thousand Island dressing because you just stir it up and they don't see the bubbles. See, I think ranch, but that's how nuts I am. Yeah, your ranch is, yeah. ranch is not a winner. Right. Ran, you know, ranch is good. Anything, because you need, you need substance in it, so you need some lumps in it, so in case mm. you blow your nose with your fingers in it? Oh, this is good. I'm not going to eat for days, David. <laughs> I'm going to have nightmares after this. I'm letting you know. His name was Judge. Judge. Listen, God will judge. Ju- inevitably. Yeah, judge was not a nice person. Yo, uh, that's my biggest fear. I'm, it must happen less, but I imagine like in the 80s at Red Lobster. That's why I like going to Houston's and those places where the food is right there at the counter. You're seeing them prepare it, but they can still do something bad to it. But just don't, don't mess with your waiters and waitresses until they, you know. But isn't it so telling of people in general how they treat others in the service industry? Because I feel like that's very, if I'm with a friend who like thinks it's okay to be rude to yeah. a wait staff person, I'm like, no, this is very, like, it says a lot about their character. Yeah, because they're they're the person that believes because you're in this position, you're a less of a person than they are. When there's a lot of people who are waiters who are just feeding their family and they're happy with what they do because they don't want to take their job home with them. Right. I know a couple of people that work in uh, Miami at some of these restaurants, they're making $150,000 a year as a waiter. In Prime 112, you go out to that restaurant, they're making a lot of money. Yes. And they don't take their job home with them. Nobody taps them on the shoulder at night and says, can I get some more tartar sauce? So they have a, you know, and they could have some, they could be investing in a, you know, in mutual funds or whatever cases. And you turn around, they got more money than you do. But yet you're talking to them like they're less of a person. A person who takes a position, nobody's ever less than you. Right. Do you... So what then becomes like the moment where you're able to, what was the next step after, after the hat? Well, uh, well, of course I would, I would go back and I would, I would uh, get t-shirts and then, then embroidery shirts, but I would close the company three times from 89 to 92 because I would run out of capital, a thousand, 5,000, whatever the case is. But uh, people who had already purchased stuff would say, man, where are you? I missed this stuff. I've been looking for you. Can I get another this? And the business would keep calling me back. Mm. It would keep calling me back. And then I would start to say, I like what I'm doing. No, I love what I'm doing. No, I would do this for free if I could. I'm finding so many other ways. I feel I feel wanted or needed. I feel like I'm validating myself. Um, and, and that would end up happening. And that, that's how I would grow the company. As I was saying, as we opened up, you never know what what things are going to be put in front of you to to guide you to where you're going to go. And you had a um, sort of endowment from your mom, right? Like she gave you some of the funds to start the business. Well, we had a house and um and I would um I I would I would pay the mortgage just like she would and 
I the story is that I started in eighty nine, but in ninety six or ninety five, it culminated to the point where I took my trip to the Magic Trade Show, the 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 fashion show in Las Vegas, and I would write three hundred thousand dollars in orders, and now I came back. And I went to 27 banks and they all turned me down to finance the orders. And my mother said, well, we have some money left in this house or in this house. And if you really have these orders, let's take a risk and take the money out of the house. And then once you sell the clothes, you'll put it back in the house. And my mother goes out and gets a $100,000 loan on our house. I have no idea how because the house is worth 75. So I didn't ask her what she did for the rest of the money. Fair. But. You, you probably know, don't want to know. I don't want to know. And we, uh, you know, uh, that's why. So it was what we would think would be a safe bet. I would end up going through the money trying to manufacture and, and learning a lot of mis- and having a lot of mistakes. I would end up later on doing a deal with Samsung to manufacture and produce my clothes. But I would end up lo- losing the whole hundred thousand dollars. I would have lost the house. Amy Schumer presents Three Girls, One Key. Let's you be a fly on comedy's filthiest wall. Each week, Amy joins her friends and fellow comedians Bridget Everett, Rachel Feinstein, and Keith Robinson for candid conversations about sex, culture, and stand-up comedy. It's your typical hard-hitting educational roundtable, except with reoccurring segments like OK, Now I'm Horny. With the help of songs, games, and special guests, Amy and her friends explore their very singular, very not-safe for work perspectives on the world. Get your mind into the gutter with comedy's greatest girl gang. Plus, well, I'm Keith. Stream the all new second season of Amy Schumer Presents Three Girls, One Keith, now on Spotify. Let's get back to the podcast. So, was it terrifying in that moment, or you just had such blinders on that you weren't really considering the idea that it wouldn't work out? Blinders. Blinders because I had a hundred thousand dollars. I never even heard of a hundred thousand dollars at that point. And yeah. that was more money than I can ever imagine having. And of course I can make all these clothes, no problem. Um, but you know, some very expensive mistakes happen. And um I would end up turning around and realizing I only have five hundred dollars in the bank and three months later on the mortgage. My mother would say to me, Damien, you know, we got to do something. So she said, I have an idea. And she took out an ad in the New York Times and it said something like, um, million dollars in orders need financing. And 33 people would call that ad. Uh, 30 of them were loan sharks. Mm. But three of them were real. And one was Samsung's textile division. And they, they were like, hey. Uh, we can finance these uh, orders if you if you really have these orders that they're by legitimate stores and they were. I imagine a guy named Bobby Batts calling your mom yeah. and being like, "Excuse me, yeah. uh, Mrs. John. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I'm going to need a 13 point vig on this. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. No, no, it was 25 point Jesus. vigs, 30 point vigs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that'd be hard to pay back. Yeah. And what did you? So would the you talk about costly mistakes? Was it just in the processing of it? Like, what was yeah, so the mistakes would be that I didn't understand the tool of money. So I would pay for raw goods 90 days ahead of time. Sheesh. Right? I had to pay for them to get them in. I'm paying for a salary and staff of people who are making the clothes. I, I turned my house into a factory, right? But then also, I didn't realize the stores don't pay you for 30, 60, and 90 days. So it was floating the capital. Mm. I was a bank and I wasn't a bank. You know, so it was just the floating of the capital. So just too much money coming out, not enough coming in. Yeah. And you spoke uh, before to sort of the the basis of where the name FUBU came from. But what was, when did you create the name? When exactly? Um, I don't know. I probably created it in 1990. It was just in my basement hanging out and drinking 40s. You know, we're <laughs> like, yo, let's call it for us. Buy us. Nobody loves us. Okay. It, I think it was right after Timbaland had made a comment in the New York Times saying, we don't sell our boots to drug dealers. And at the time, everybody in New York wore Timberlands. We wore them like Jordans, right? And, you know, we just got tired of hearing. Nobody likes rappers or nobody likes whatever. I mean, they didn't say black people. They just said, we don't sell our boots to drug dealers. Now, I guess they were thinking all people who love hip hop because Timberland was the boot of hip hop were drug dealers. And that's not the case. So I said, what's well, somebody going to just love the people that they sell to? And that's that's how Forest Bias came up. Was it a light bulb moment or just over time you were like, damn, that was a good choice? It was a light bulb moment, but the light bulb 
No, I never thought it was a good choice because once I did my deal with Samsung, I wanted to change the name. And they were like, why? I was like, I don't like it. They were like, but it's a good name. I was like, ah. And I realized, you don't know what a fubu is. Is it the poo-poo platter at a Chinese restaurant? Fubu? Is it Italian? Is it whatever? And, you know, and then they were like, and we can clear the name easily. Sure. So, like, people who are listening to us now, you know, if you coming up with stuff like Tommy or, or, or Tanya as your clothing line, it's not something that's clearable. Right. You want to come up with Facebook, Google. You know what I mean? Uh, FUBU. You know what I mean? You want to come up with yeah, Uber. <laughs> yeah. Very, very clear and distinctive names that you can clear. Right. So um, so I was never super high on the name until later on. It started to grow all these dynamics. You know, people thought it was food before us bias. Kids in New York, food before us bias. Black people, food before us bias. Hip hop. It, it just started to take on a life of its own. And when was the first person that you put a piece of FUBU, uh, the first person of notoriety that you put a piece of FUBU on where it made an impact? Yeah, so it was a, it was an artist named Miss Jones. She had a song called Where I Wanna Be Boy. And uh, I think the video had Moni Love in the video. That was the first one. The second one was one day I was home and, and in my house and the door, doorbell rings. I opened the door and it's, old dirty bastard he was standing right there and i was like yo He's, i bet odb makes house calls oh yeah i'm like yo OD, yo, who, who, it's old dirty bastard and he uh he was like i want a shirt i was like who the hell told you where i live he's like everybody <laughs> right. knows where you live he never paid me for the shirt either i don't doubt that r.i.p don't don't OB. ever yeah r.i.p don't don't ever think you're gonna get paid by anybody named old dirty bastard it's not not a good thing but can we say though like and i find it and i'm guilty of this actors people in the music industry god we want a lot for nothing yeah no one loves a freebie like a famous but person. he told me he was gonna pay me <laughs> yeah don't tell me that the next person uh, and then ll cool j would do it would would wear it on um hey love a video where he was wearing a fubu and that would just send us to the moon and was there ever moments where you would see perhaps people wearing FUBU that all of a sudden your brand would get associated maybe with things you didn't want it to be associated with? No. The only time that I got upset is that when it was we were known as the black racist company because all, all we sold was to black people. And it was hard to because social media wasn't out then. So you're looking at a company that is – powered by african-american art which is rap but we also didn't want to be prejudiced like timberland at the same time and there were a lot of people of other cultures the first place that we would sell once we opened we, we took an ad and i think right on magazine would be seattle washington and japan and they weren't african-americans buying it it was the skateboarders in seattle washington that love you know nirvana who was rebellious who would buy it and it was the kids in japan who would wear blackface out of respect right. for african-american culture blackface and next jerseys so we love that anybody and everybody could wear it and when this perception of of us being uh you know excluding every other you know uh, every other nationality or race um that used to always upset me however I never wanted to get on press and say to the to African Americans, no, this is not something of yours, because they coveted it like we finally have ours and we have something. So that was always a challenge. But when people wore it, um, you know, that's what fashion is. It's supposed to be your interpretation of something. And honestly, some of the worst times when people wore it were the best sales. Every time Daryl Strawberry got arrested for smoking crack, he was in a FUBU <laughs> shirt. And right. those sales would go woo right out the roof. I loved it. <laughs> God bless Daryl Strawberry. <laughs> I've, I've heard he's incredibly, uh, he's very talented in, in the lady department. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, and so the... What was there? I want to hear about the moment where obviously you had given the shirts out to important people and whatnot, and you're building your building. When's the moment that you're walking down, I don't know, Lexington Boulevard, or you're, you know, you're in Queens and you see a civilian in a piece of FUBU and you're like, I made that. That's mine. Uh, you know, I don't remember anymore. You know? It's been so long, um, but it happened many times. And we, I would just be like, holy crap, look at that. I, it, it, it yeah, I still, till today, I still will see somebody wearing something and go, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. 
Well, do you remember I posted a photo on Instagram? I saw it. Yeah. With, what, were you in a casino? You better believe at it. At that age? <laughs> well, I think it was like one of those corny, I'm 14, like, mom, take a picture of me next to the slot machine. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, uh, I thought you were like a degenerate 14 gambling already <laughs> in a casino. And what casino allowed you to do that? We've all got it. It was, it was a small, uh, it was Morongo near Palm Desert. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and I just remember like having such a point, especially a FUBU jersey, which yeah. at that time was a high ticket Did item. Did you see, was it in San that got you to wear that jersey who, who was it? because i remember when nobody would dress the insync kids and i remember um the, none, none of the urban brands because they said they're white and right. um i remember going down to the studio saying i don't care if they're white black or indifferent if, the, if i like their music yeah i'm gonna address them and i went down to the studio and i said isn't that justin from the mickey mouse club i love the mickey mouse club and i would dress them and then all of a sudden we just started getting all these orders from kansas and nebraska and just it just it, it was just like it, it was incredible found found its way to middle america yeah it's funny i grew up you know 13 and i would go to in new york go to a and s mall mm -hmm. and on the fourth floor a and s mall was like this store called hype or something uh -huh. and it had fat farm and aniche and fubu and peli peli uh -huh. and you know, I grew up in hip hop culture. It's what I loved. And so like the first time I could buy like a legit piece and not like a bootleg Tommy Hilfiger right. uh, collared shirt from uh -huh. the Jamaican dude on the corner, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was I was stoked and it was a point of pride. So and especially a high ticket like those jerseys at the time. Yeah. I mean, those were like over 100 bucks. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I they was were like, very expensive. So that that only came out during nice casino trips. You know what <laughs> I mean? I wasn't wearing that to the corner store. Right. Can you like distill two or three moments that were like touchstone moments for the company that where you hit like certain level of millions and then hundred millions and then eventually billions? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was when my deal with Samsung was to keep my distribution deal, I would have to sell $5 million worth of clothes in three years. And I remember them saying to me one day, I was like, you know, do you think we're going to hit this deal? You know, you know, it was, it was a couple of months in. They were like, "I think so." You you sold thirty million dollars worth of clothes in three months. I didn't I didn't realize how much we had sold. So that was like, holy crap! Wow. Um, uh, another time was when we would um, be asked to literally, literally sit in the Macy's windows. And, you know, as a designer, you want your clothes in the Macy's window. I was sitting, you know, we were sitting in the Macy's window with television cameras from like Channel 7 in New York or whatever the case is. And I was like, OK, this is the real deal. And then, uh, you know, the, the time when we got off the plane in South Africa and we, we were opening a store there and there were just thousands of people in the street, you know, to see the FUBU guys actually get there. I was like, who are they here for? You know, and, um, and then we were there and at the time Mandela had already uh, went out of office, but uh, we met the president of South Africa and then Mandela called us and said, I want I want to I want you to come meet me. Madiba. Yeah. Are you yeah. kidding? So what the, was that yeah. like? It's amazing. I mean, you know, you're meeting a piece, you, you're meeting a, a person who's changed, helped change the world. Right. Um, and he knows who you are. Wow. Yeah. So some really, really, really great times. And. So you've got these moments and you're starting to accrue, um, you know, financial success and whatnot. Was there a moment in which you, did you hit a certain number with personal wealth where you felt like, I'm going to be all right. Like if nothing else happens from here, I'm going to have enough to probably survive the rest of my life. Or does that moment never come? Yeah, no, the moment comes, but when I made my first million, I never knew how poor I was until I made my first million. Sure. Because by the time you pay, I paid off all my credit card debts and the old house and then take care of a couple of, you know, bills here and there, give mom money. I had like a hundred thousand dollars left. Yeah. Right. You make a million government takes 400,000 of it. So now you got 600,000 of it left and you know, a hundred thousand dollars, you realize you're on all credit cards and medical bills. And then you got 500 and you buy, you know, a modest car and, you know, make sure mom's good on the house. You're done. Right. So that, that was surprising to me. Uh, later on, I would blow about $10 million and not understanding 
again, not having financial intelligence. You know, investing in the market when it was high, as soon as the market crashed, I was so scared. I thought it would keep going down. I pulled the money out, so invest in high and sell when it's low, right? Buying a house for a million or two million, but not knowing, not realizing, wait a minute, you got to furnish the house. You got to you gotta pay for taxes every year in the house. So it's not now two million, it's three million if you look at it like that. Oh, decide I need to fly private all the time because that's what rich people do. But it is nice. It's nice. I don't, I don't really like flying private too much. I fly private only when the deal I'm going to make uh, uh, is way more and I need to get there. Yeah. If I have a staff of eight and it's going to cost almost the same to get there and or if I it's a timely manner and I need to get there. But I don't really like flying private, you know. I remember once, uh, forgive the name drop, I was on a private jet with John Stamos, no big mm -hmm. deal. Yeah. You know, the circle, so I travel in. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember he goes up into the cockpit and he's like joking around with the pilots and they're very nice. And he's like, oh guys, I smell a little booze up here. What have you been doing? Uh -huh. And they're like, no, 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 no. And they point to the black box, which uh -huh. is always recording. They're like, you're gonna get our license taken yeah, away, yeah, Dick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but I remember that. And yeah, I mean, the whole private plane experience. And I'm not one for like, I love me a great Olive Garden experience. Yeah, yeah. I like I like a BMW, which is like a nice car, but it ain't a Maybach. Right. But when I got on that private plane, I'm like, oh, having money is nice. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I, I just don't like it. I'll tell you why. I don't like it. You know, round trip, when I go private, New York to LA is $60,000. Jesus. Right? That's a $60,000. And not catered, right? It's not catered. So you got to bring the, the food is all cold. You got to bring it on there with you. Right. You don't have a bed. You're Crazy. not, you know, you're not like, it's not like JetBlue Mint or any of these lay down beds things. You are either going to sleep on the floor or, I mean, you're going to recline the seat all the way back. Okay. I don't have to deal with one. I get there basically two hours earlier than you, mm. right? So, so look at the round trip. It's four hours, right? But if I took uh, me and two other people go on first class, you know, I spent about you know, five thousand dollars from New York to LA. If I go commercial, sure. So for four hours, I'm getting paid fifty five thousand dollars for four hours. Now I go to LA twenty times a year, right? Makes perfect sense to me. I just took a jet over here from uh, Vegas. It, it was so goddamn hot on that plane because, you know, um, I'm talking about a private flight. I had to, you know, get over here in time. The Vegas was like 105 degrees yesterday or the day before. And by the time that plane cooled off, I was uh, I was I was here already, but it was miserable. And because it was so small with the, with the, uh, whatever you call it, the, that thing was jumping around. Yeah, it was, it was miserable. That's right, people. We have challenges too, celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying all this to say, anybody make, make, get, making some money out there, don't, would you, would you charter a tour bus to get from, uh, from Manhattan to Queens to go see your mom? So what the hell are you flying oh. a jet for? So anyway, th those are some of the mistakes that I made uh, financially when I was younger. Yeah, no, I take the, the A train or the F. There you go. Come on. Two bucks, can't beat it. Um, so I guess, and this is really a personal question for me, is that do you ever feel, obviously the poison is in the dose, right? So, so much of, of your childhood created this deep ambition in you and, you know, nurture from your family and whatnot to like provide and to prove yourself and all these things. And yet do you attain a certain level where the volume on that gets turned down a little bit to where you feel kind of okay in the world for a minute? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Yeah. Right now I'm great. You know, I don't have, I, I've been, I've been blessed enough to be on a show that is, um, you know, really empowered so many people. Um, so I don't have to overcompensate for anything. You know, I don't need to pull up in a Ferrari cause you already know I have assets, mm. right? Um, I don't need to, you know, shout out, do you know who I am? Because you probably know who I am when I walk in the room. And I don't need to tell you how smart I am because if you see me on a show, you probably have seen me articulate something in a way that, you know, I'm just no idiot. Okay, am I, do I know everything? Absolutely not. But you know that I know a, a little bit of something. Um, so I don't have the challenges that a lot of people have and more, and, and people don't have to question if I, if I'm a person who wants to give to others, because I try to give as much as I can, so I can turn the volume down now, right? 
did you see, was it surprising to you how, like, I love Howard Stern and he's king of all media and yeah. he's paid and, and legitimized in on so many levels. And yet when he went to go do, what was it? The, the America's got talent. Mm -hmm. So many people were surprised, but I'm like, Oh, I'm not. I said, cause that's a whole new audience that might not be as familiar with him as we are. Yeah. Did you find that with shark tank? How, how you were exposed to people, so many people that might not have been as aware of you? 100%. I mean, you know, um, before that, I did have the challenges of, you know, I, I remember, you know, if you knew that I was smart or anything else, because they thought the FUBU guy was going to walk into the room with baggy jeans on, gold teeth and a pistol and start breakdancing and rapping. You know, they had the stigmatism, um, a stigma. But, you know, a after the show, you know, um, after years of the show, you know, so many people that uh, just respected me for being a man or said I empowered them and they were of all races, color, creeds and everything else. And it, it absolutely opened me up to the entire world. And what's the fatal flaw of a bad pitch or what's the fatal flaw of a pitch on Shark Tank where you make a snap judgment that you're like, nope, this isn't going to win. If I only had 1% of, it's a $50 billion market. And if I only get 1% of 1% of 1%, that is a bunch of guessing. Mm. You're thinking that if you get there and you're telling me how big the market is, every market is big. So is the bankruptcy market too, right? You may get 1% of the bankruptcy market. So you're guessing, you know, at that point. So when you feel like even if the, in, in great success, the, the return isn't worthwhile. Yeah. And even, you know, also the opening up of, uh, you know, hey, I'm so forth and so on. I want $250,000 for 4% of my company. That's the immediate. Okay. Here's what goes off in my mind. 4% you're ignorant right now and you think your shit don't stink mm. number one or you've raised so much capital by other people that you're desperately looking to get off of four percent because you've blown all the other capital right one of the others gonna happen and or you just don't want a deal you came here not to get a deal so you can get a commercial so what's a respectable percentage to open up with 10 percent minimum 10 percent. i would say 10 because you know you're asking a shark to put time in. Nobody gets out of bed for five. I mean, why would I Why would I get out of bed for less than, you know, 10%? I mean, I, I'm not incentivized, mm. you know? You know, people coming on the show, they're, they, they have a business. They want their business to grow. But however, they don't look at us going, actually, you have a business too of investing. You want your business to grow. They look at it as, you know what? I want you to invest. And I want you to advise me. And I want to call you every single day. Well, when I invest in Tesla, uh, you know, Elon doesn't call me. Yeah. I open up my, uh, you know, mailbox and I make some money or my email, whatever it is. They don't call me with any problem. So if I'm going to get this kind of return on Tesla or Apple or Shopify and that stuff like that, why am I going to invest in you and then have to deal with you every day? I might as well put that back in the FUBU where I own more of it. So a lot of people don't look at it like that. They look at it as, oh, you know, uh, you know invest in me and then be my uh you know be my daddy did you see elon smoke weed on joe rogan i heard about it <laughs> yeah i heard he was puffing he didn't even inhale no no i couldn't believe it he took a real dad hit oh okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> but if elon did call you what would you want to talk about with a guy like that because i find him fascinating i've talked to elon before um but we, we just had a very casual conversation sure um i don't know what we talk about to be very honest i mean Listen, I, I, I love the way these forward thinkers think, you know, like I like, you know, like he was saying, you know, he doesn't believe that we're going to go up in the sky and drive cars. We're, we're going to go under underneath the ground, you know, with the hyperloop, whatever the case is. So I like to hear stuff like that. What are these people thinking? They're thinking on a global scale, these billionaires of of how to change the world. And it's fascinating. Do you think there's a disconnect between and I don't mean to be critical of Elon Musk because he's Elon Musk, but like. I find that people like that, the true outside thinkers, forward thinkers, as you said, that they should be left to do that. And I think it's what they love and what they're great at. And as soon as you make them take the CEO role of things and do the business side and the people management and managing shareholders is where sometimes there's an issue because they're not necessarily, that's not necessarily, necessarily their forte. Yeah. In one sense, you think like that. 
and 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 I get that. However, if they don't have any grounds of reality on what the cause and effect is, mm. it can also alter the outcome, right? It's kind of like you know these these people who aren't entrepreneurs, but yet they want to put up a million dollar advertising campaign that they're not thinking. Okay, there's some pretty ass pictures. Now who's going to buy the goods? Yeah. You know, so I think that the reporting to shareholders and these things brings your weaknesses or your strengths out. You know, you look at somebody like um, the founders of Uber and they had these issues, you know, in you know how they were um, managing people or not managing the correct way. But if you're three guys in a basement, you're not even thinking about a trillion dollar company or a billion dollar company five years, 10 years down the road. You're trying to do the best you can to grow the company. Then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, guys, it's not the boys club anymore. You have people who are depending on you and they need to be treated with respect. But you're not thinking about that from the creative side when you're just starting it. So until in, unless you bring people in to spank them and say, bad boy, bad girl, or whatever yeah. the case is. You, 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 you don't get, they, they never come back to reality. So I think that they, you need some kind of constraints and things of that nature. You're just going to have tyrants running around who are unchecked, who are lying all the time, who, you know, are offending, uh, you know, other uh, allies and or disrespecting everybody in the country. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, we're, we're talking about running. That's right. We're running a company. <laughs> right. Do you... <laughs> I know. I what did Larry Moore, uh, Larry Wilmore calls Trump um, Orange Amin. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's pretty good. Um, do you? You know, you want to tell you, you want me to tell you something random that I've never told anybody? Please. My stepfather, the Jewish one, mm. he slept next to Trump for two years in that academy. They were they were um, roommates. No way. Yeah. And. So I can tell you. Come on! I know some juicy stuff. I bet he slept butt naked in an all boys academy. Trump slept naked. I, I know, know I it. I don't know what that. <laughs> he, he didn't tell me if he was sleeping next to him, rubbing one out. But you know, he, he did sleep next to him. That's fascinating. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I'd love to know more. Well, I can't <laughs> tell you. You know, everybody uh, when Trump got elected, uh, a lot of the press looked up the yearbook and called all the the people who went to school with him to try to get dirt, you know, but my, my stepfather, all he cares about is saving animals. He couldn't kill us yeah. by anything else. He will, you know, he'll shy away from politics, but you shoo a pigeon away in mm -hmm. front of him. He will crack your head to the white meat. Yeah. God bless. That damn pigeon has a right to. Yeah, they do. They yeah. can, those pigeons can be jerks. Yeah. Um, so, do you satisfy that role when you're investing in a company or you're sitting on the board of a company? Are you the guy who's like, I'm best suited because I'm I'm brilliant at marketing or I'm brilliant at making introductions or I'm good at wrangling in a, a innovative CEO who maybe doesn't understand the totality? Um, no, because unless it's my own company, I don't have controlling interest and I'm only there to give them the guidance that they request. Mm. Um, have I had to uproot people? Yes, and I don't like it because I don't want to take over the business, you know. Um, but I find that my most successful companies are companies that they didn't need me in the first place. They only come to me when they really, really need a connection or a decision being made. Um, so I'm fortunate enough to just either step away or 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 speak up when I'm asked to to speak up. And what makes a great CEO? Great CEOs are problem solvers. Uh, great CEOs have much smarter people working for them, and they know it. Great CEOs are Batman, and their staff is Robin, but yet they know when to become Robin and let the staff be Batman. Um, they know their weaknesses. They fail fast. They value, they really value people. They, they are ready to get down and do whatever they got to do to value the people that work for them, because by far the people are the ones that are going to be the the bloodline of the company. So um, they're not visionaries, most of them. Most of them are not visionaries. Most of them are doing the best they can do today to, to, to be the best they can for their customer today. And that would then spark off something that they will end up doing tomorrow. And they'll do it all over again and keep doing it better and better and better. And conversely, what do you think is the most insidious trait in people that sabotages them from success? Doing it for an ego. They want to tell everybody when to get coffee. 
Yeah. You know, for them and they, you know, they're 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 in the ivory tower in the corner office and they don't want to they want to demean people. They don't want to give people credit for what they do because they don't realize that people will work for acknowledgement more than they work for or more than they want sex or money or anything else. Um, they're erratic. They're, they're thinking. They don't want to admit they're wrong. People who don't want to admit they're wrong will never learn from anything that they've done, any action they've taken. Um, th- those are those are the type of people. They just they just don't learn, and they don't want to continue to educate themselves. They'll say that oh, what the, oh social media, social media, and all of a sudden they'll turn around and ten years have passed, and retail is no longer there, and everybody's selling off of Instagram and Facebook, and they'll say, why the hell is my company not working? Well, you didn't want to learn, right? You know. Do you think, I mean, I see that in you, a certain level of reinvention, because it seems like there's a shelf life to any good thing, and it's cyclical, right? Sure. So, sure. like, here you are, you know, a titan of the fashion industry, and then you move on to Shark Tank, which is a new invention, and now here you are, like, embracing social media sure. and podcasts, yeah, and yeah. so... and. But it's necessary, right? You have to. You have to grow. You have to. And I, I'm also, you know, I, I remember thinking... And I don't have ADHD or ADD, whatever it is. But I remember watching Richard Branson one time, and um, he said, "You know, I, I, I started with Virgin and this and that and records or whatever, and I love the business. And then I just got bored with it. I had a good time, and then I started to look at Virgin Airlines, Virgin Soda, Virgin Cola, Virgin everything else. He said, "I realized that every new business is like a cracker jack box, and if I can just bring the fundamentals, but yet learn." all the new nuances of this business, I will be well-rounded and I'm fascinated by it. And I said to myself, damn, that's me. That is me. I'm not the person. Now, don't get me wrong. You have Phil Knight here looking at the same damn swoosh for 20 years and he can, or, or 40 years and he can build it to be a $35 billion annual company. Hey. God bless him. I, I can't look at the same swoosh every day. How I many, t- the swoosh would have been a circle by the time with me because I just, I get tired of that. So. Um, I think that that's my my form of uh, you know of enjoyment is seeing progression and taking on new challenges and new spaces. And I think you mentioned this when we had dinner years ago, which was something to the effect of like I invest in ten businesses and nine fail, but yeah. the tenth one pays for the rest. That's right. Is yeah. that true? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because and the nine that failed, I learned from the nine that made the ten great. Yes. You know, because, you know, a true entrepreneur has started many businesses over the course of their time. But what they did was the first business they started, they didn't have proper funding. So the second business they started had proper funding, but bad legal structure. The third business had proper funding and great legal structure, but no distribution and so on and so on and so on. And by the time you get to 10, you're like, I got it all. Yeah. You know, came together. Yeah. How quickly do you recover? Not, I don't want to say recover, but just emotionally, because I don't imagine any sort of... Um, quote unquote, not failure, but if a business doesn't work, how quickly do you get over something like that? Do you mourn it for a couple hours and then you're like on to the next? No, well, it all depends on how 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 long it takes to break it down. Mm. Because usually the business that is uh, failing can be six months of you trying to figure it out and going, guys, we're on, we're on life support here. Then another six months of uh, breaking it down and then another six months of saying, all right, what the hell happened here? And, and why, how are we not going to repeat this mistake again? Right. But it's not being being defined. Because I, I know for someone like me is I can be, you know, when I, when I take a loss or take an L, as the kids say, mm-hmm. and I, I'll sort of lament in it to my detriment at times, or I'll try to really reinvestigate it instead of, to your point, failing fast and just chalking yeah. it up as a learning moment and on to the next. Yeah, I try not to. I mean, yeah, I mean, but listen, you got to lick your wounds and it all depends on how much you had invested in it. Because if it was something for five years that you were trying and you wanted to do it five years prior, well, then you're going to you're going to suffer for five years after. Mm. So it all depends on how much emotionally have you committed yourself to it and time wise and how much your family's time was in it and a lot of other things. And of of course, if it's a big public loss, even when you don't want to think about it. Other people are going to remind you, hey, whatever happened to that? They, they may not try to be negative about it. A couple of people will be like, yeah, what happened? Right. Man, you, you, you know, everything was all fly, right? Yeah. But, you know, but we look at the, you know, we look at the people who are truly successful and they just keep, again, reinventing themselves and keep doing, you know, more and more and bigger and better. Any good Shark Tank stories that we didn't get to see on TV? 
Uh, they're always. I mean, because those pitches are an hour long, right? An hour or it could be. Could I be. heard it's hot. And maybe just for the people pitching, but under those lights, I hear there's a lot more schwitzing. The, yeah, yeah, the, and it, perspiration it, it get, going on. It can on. get very hot. I mean, listen, you get you, you get five of us are drilling you. You're there for an hour, standing up underneath these lights, and we're we're, we're hammering you with, with hard questions, and and you know, uh, and so so yeah. I mean, there's so many. You know, Barbara is a full fledged. People don't know this, but she's a full fledged pervert. <laughs> I'm talking trench coat, lollipop, mustache. I'm talking I pervert. Can see that. She touches everyone. Mm. She doesn't care about color or gender. She'll touch every single person. Her husband's right there, like, oh, God, stop. Equal opportunity hands. Yeah, she will pinch everyone's hiney in the whole place if she had to. Okay. Um, so she's always she's always crazy. Uh I didn't know we just have so many stories. I I don't I don't even know which one which one is uh I can't even think of which one which which one is funnier or not. What's the fastest you've made an offer? I think the fastest I made an offer was a company called uh it was it was a it was a cup company with they had a cavity in the bottom of the cup where you can turn it over and do shots out of the plastic cup like a solo cup. I think I made that offer in like 12 minutes was the fastest, yeah. And is there a part of you that that even if it's a great idea, are you also taking into account the personalities of the people? Because there is there is a life is too short clause in all this, right? Yeah. Like, this might be a great idea, but you seem like you suck. Like, I don't want to hear from you for the next year and a half. Plenty of times. Right? More than normal. Because, listen, you have a great product. I'll buy one. Mm. I don't need to buy the company. I'll just buy one. Yeah. Right? So I'll buy one of your sponges. I don't like you. <laughs> uh, I, I, you the other day, yesterday or two days of shooting now, I, just, I tell somebody, I mean, every question we asked them was like a half an hour, you know, a uh, half an hour answer. And, and I remember saying, I, I'm sorry, I can't do the deal because I don't want to call you. I don't, I don't want to have to put on pajamas and get some Ovaltine every time I got to call you because you're going to talk me to sleep. I just don't want to do it. I don't yeah. have time for it. And. And I'll only ask you two more questions. I don't want to keep you all day, but what do you think of the, I know, you know, you're on Instagram. What do you think of this quote unquote hustle culture? And I'm not talking about your kind of hustling, someone that's actually made something of themselves. I'm talking about like when someone's doing some like motivation Monday um, from their mom's house because they're 35 and still live there. And they're like, what's yeah. up, gang? Yeah. Just waking up for that next hustle. Yeah, Keep yeah, it yeah. going today. And like, it seems like people just feel good to say it. And that's like all they're achieving. Like, yeah. it's a weird culture in I, that I, way, right? I, I, and you know, and I think that that's creating a bad environment because, and what, listen, we all know that everybody on Instagram is is showing only the highlight. It's a highlight reel, right? They're they're smarter, they're sexier, they're skinnier, they're wealthier than you when they are at home with their mommy, <laughs> right? But it, it's unhealthy, you know, because you know if you wake up in the morning and you know I always tell people due to my rise and grind book, like don't open your emails for the first hour because the emails are only everybody else's problems. Mm. Uh, no emails are like, hey, you know that problem that we had last week? I saw that I'm sending you a million dollars. You're never going to get that email, right? So if you wake up in the morning answering everybody's emails, you are not taking time for yourself, for your family. You're just answering everybody's problems. Then all of a sudden, you look on Instagram. And now you get social media depression because everybody's doing so great. So now you wake up answering everybody else's problems and depressed because it looks like everybody else has, uh, you know, a better life than you. They're all in Greece with six packs. Yeah, it, it's crazy. It, it, exactly. When reality is, if you're an entrepreneur, an intrapreneur, you know, we're looking at, un unfortunately, what happened to Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain, you know, you feel like you don't have anybody to talk to. And you feel like uh, you can be an entrepreneur and, and just like being an everyday person working in a company, you're living check to check because of the check that's coming this month for the company, you gotta tell your employees, you gotta go home. But you can't tell them that because then they're gonna start looking for jobs if you tell them that, hey, we're on our last leg. However, all your employees are telling you their problems because you're the boss. And you can't share this with anybody else in your life, right? So you get this feeling of depression because you feel this pressure because everybody's on Instagram talking about, hey gang, Right. Hustle, hustle. No, don't fuck hustle. Go home to your family. Go take care of your health. Understand you have flaws like everybody else. And if you do that, then you start to be able to face the reality. But all this stuff that everybody's saying, it's bullshit. Right. And, 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 and if, as long as people understand that, then they get to get on their grind. You know, the grind that yeah. they understand that they that they can do, you know.
God bless. First of all, that was beautiful. And secondly, I feel like there should be a social media for the day after. So yeah. you don't you don't see people at the club. Yeah. You see them like hugging the toilet bowl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Talking to God. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. The people are taking the pictures. Look at their six pack, looking at their belly, going, <laughs> I ain't seen my candy in two years. Right. <laughs> um, oh, just a quick aside, you know, being so immersed in hip hop culture when it was great, and yeah. I'm talking great, yeah. 1994, come on, uh -huh. like, this is when, a moment, does like, I, I don't mean to call him out, and I'm not trying to stir shit, but like, does the little Zan culture, little pump, like, does this level of hip hop bum you out at times? Because it bums me out. It does. I don't, I don't really, I, I, I don't really listen to the artists out today, I guess, you know, not that I don't respect or value them. I still like Wayne and, 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 and a couple of them. I like Drake and a couple of artists, but I don't get it, you know? Mm. Um, but again, I'm almost 50. I don't, I'm not supposed to get it. I don't think, uh, you know, I'm not the one buying, buying, downloading. Well, I was about to say buying records, Amazing. I'm not, you know, <laughs> so, Hit um, up, uh, Tower Records. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get me an LP. Yeah. Um. So, so I, yeah, it's not, it's not my thing right now. You know, um, I like a uh, Ray, Ray was Shreman, Shreman, Ray that? Sherman, Shaman, Shermer. Yeah, whatever the case sounds is. Sounds good. So, uh, that night, uh, well, so, yeah, whatever. Yeah, it sounds fabulous. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. They're amazing. Everyone should rewind that clip. Ray Schwimmer. Ray Schwimmer. It sounds like a because they remind me of the shawarmas, the sandwiches that they make. You know the shawarma. Yeah, so they call Ray Schwimmer. Yeah. If you ever need a good shawarma recommendation in L.A., I'm your guy. All right. Just good. saying, good. I have skills. Okay. Last question. This is a question I ask everyone on the pod. What are your one or three or five Damon John commandments? Things, truths that you have found to be so important for you that you'd want to impress upon someone who was looking for your guidance. Yeah. Um, money is a great slave, but a horrible master. Uh, you must read your goals daily and be in control of the goals that you want to execute. Because if you're not, then you're going to let other people set goals for you. Um, your health by far is the most important thing because if you don't have have health, you won't have anything. So the whole the old saying of a, a man or a woman with their health has a thousand dreams. A man or a woman without their health only has one. Family is by far the most important thing as well besides your health that you should go towards because the only reason you're working so hard normally is for the ones you love. And uh, you must put God first. Mic drop. <laughs> that's it uh, that's it that's thank what you so like. much for doing this thank you brother appreciate it much respect and by the way Kristen was having an aneurysm when she saw you were coming in oh thank you Christian <laughs> a, 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 a true Kristen. fan <laughs> oh thank you thanks Damon you got it ah, that was it that's the podcast Damon John that happened and now you're done with this and Thanksgiving is either in two days or it's in a day or you're listening to this on Thanksgiving while you're cooking. What are you cooking? Turkey is gross in my opinion, but all the sides, all the accoutrement that comes with it, lovely. I mean, green bean casserole, yes. Stuffing, mm-hmm. My... I'm really trying not to curse as much because my mom does listen to the podcast and she was like, you know, you're doing great. I'm very impressed. Wonderful questions. But the cursing, enough. She's not wrong. Damn it. No, um, guys, have an awesome Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for you, the curious listeners, because I get to do something really cool that I love and talk to people that I respect and I'm fascinated by. And the only way I get to do it is when you listen. And that means the world to me. So thank you. I'm thankful for you. And most importantly, I'm thankful for you, Kevin. Thank you for listening to me rant and, you know, cutting in the commercials that pay for this podcast. Because if I, I didn't make money from this, I wouldn't do it. All right, guys. Love you. See you next week. Bye.